Uh, thanks for that introduction. Uh, I've given presentations, um, uh, a lot of presentations to natural naturalists all over the uh, state of Texas. And y'all always have the best feedback. And I think some of the best interaction, uh, not only uh, with doing nurdle patrols and uh, stuff like that, but uh, also with getting involved with uh, Texas Plastic Pollution Symposium, which I'm not going to really talk about today. But um, we host one every year. I know Steny Metters is on here. She led the one that was held up in Galveston in 2019. Uh, last year, we held one down in um, South Padre. And then in 2022, we're going to be holding one here in Port Aransas. And so uh, that is, if you're, if you're interested in plastics and some of the stuff I'll talk about today, uh, y'all should look into that. And that will be March 31st. 2022 is we'll be hosting that in Port Aransas, but we bring researchers in from around the state of Texas to talk about, you know, kind of the stuff I'll be talking to you about today, but really gets into the research. And so there's a lot of students and faculty that get together. Uh, and so that we're trying to fill the gap in what we don't know about plastics in the environment. But uh, today I'm going to talk to you, if you haven't heard about nurdles before, uh, after this talk, you're going to hear everything you ever wanted to know about nurdles and more. And you'll be an expert nerdler. So um, in kind of the basics, there's really two types of microplastic we're, we're going to talk about. And microplastic is anything less than five millimeters in size. And so that's pretty small. Everything else we consider macroplastic. So, you know, a lot probably y'all have been involved in a lot of cleanups and stuff like that. Uh, water bottles, all that kind of stuff. That's all like macroplastic. But all that stuff over time with UV light, wave action, wind, you know, it all breaks down. You know, plastic doesn't dissolve, it just breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces, right? And so that it, it's all going to end up eventually being microplastic. And so that's what you see in this image here, is there's a lot of little bits of different colors of plastic. Uh, it's irregular shape. Um, it, it's flat. You know, it used to be an object. But if you look real close, there are some little round beads in there, and those are nurdles. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, and those are considered primary plastics. So these are plastics that haven't even been made into anything yet. It's the raw material, everything plastic. And so that's, that's primary plastic. Their secondary plastics are things that have already been made into something and have already broken down into these little bitty pieces. So... You know, how are these little uh, microplastics that we're calling nurdles, how do these nurdles get out into the environment? Well, there's a number of different ways. And so uh, they make these in a factory and you'll find all different shapes and sizes, uh, you know, all, all small, but there'll be different colors. Uh, some will be flat, some will be square, some will be oblong, some will be almost perfectly round. Um, they get that way because of how they make them. And so there's a, a metal plate called an extrusion plate that they push all this hot plastic through. It goes into a cold dip or, or cool air and then it's chopped up into small pieces. And that's how it gets its shape and size. But these are so small, you know, they store them in silos. Uh, and then to be able to get them out of those silos, they have to hook them up into hoses. They either, either gravity feed them or pneumatically blow them into like rail cars, trucks. Uh, they bag them up and uh, ship them all over the world. But when they do that, there's a little bit of uh, that could get on the ground every time they hook up a hose or, or something like that. And then what happens with anything on the ground? It rains, gets into the storm water. Then uh, the nearest, once it rains, it gets into the nearest creek or river, bay then into the Gulf or any ocean, and then ultimately back up on the beach. And so that's why we're finding so many of them. And I'm going to tell you how many you're finding there in Galveston. I think you're going to be pretty amazed. But really, uh, this isn't just at the manufacturing site these are getting out. It's, it's at the manufacturing site. It's uh, during transportation at any of those ones I talked about with rail car, truck, uh, shipping. Uh, and then once they get to their final destination, they have to be offloaded from these vessels and they can get out onto the ground then. So, uh, you know, they can get out anywhere along the way. Now, this is sort of a visual of what I just talked about, you know, along the railroads, uh, you can have a lot of uh, pellet loss. Uh, the image in the middle with that blue corrugated tube, that's the tube where they pneumatically blow them in from the silo into rail cars. Um, 
And so that's a way they can get out onto the ground when that hose is hooked on or, or taken off. Uh, and then the things that you hear about, usually about once or twice a year, you'll hear about a big spill that happens either uh, you know, off a barge or a ship. And uh, you'll have container ships that are full of nurdles that just break open and then, you know, nurdles all in the ocean. And that's what you see in that bottom right hand corner is just a cloud, that white cloud in the ocean there. That's all nurdles, billions of nurdles. And the last one that happened was this uh, last summer in Sri Lanka. So Sri Lanka had a big uh, ship that was like 200 containers full of nurdles. And they had waist deep nurdles on their beaches there in Sri Lanka. It's a really sad situation. Um, uh, prior to that, Mississippi River uh, had a container go overboard uh, last summer in 2020. And uh, they, they had, they had uh, thick nurdles along their shorelines uh, for a number of weeks. And so you can actually see that in the data. If you go to nurdlepatrol.org and on the homepage, we have a chart that shows um, number of nurdles collected by day and you'll see a big spike in the data and that was because there was a big spill on the Mississippi River and they were picking them up by the bucket loads with their hands and so um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that once we get to the showing you the maps of the data but you know this isn't anything new this is we've known about this uh, for decades and actually in the Environmental Protection Agency Back in 1992, wrote a report called Plastic Pellets in the Aquatic Environment, Sources and Recommendations. This is a PDF that you can get online. You're just going to type that in. Um, they listed in this report back in 1992 that there was 80, over 80 species of shorebirds that they knew about at the time that were eating these. Uh, four different species of sea turtles and a number of different fish. And so, you know, really the biggest impact of these being in the environment is the consumption by wildlife. And so you, in this report, you can see that black and white photo right in the middle. That's the intestinal tract of a shorebird. And it had eaten pellets and that's how it died. Uh, and, and they can die from starvation. You know, they, they feel like they're full, they can starve to death. They also, these nurdles in there can twist around their intestines to where uh, it blocks anything from going through. So even if they did eat something that had nutritional value, it couldn't make it through their system. Um, and then the other thing we worry about with these is that we know that these absorb harmful chemicals when they're in the environment. And so uh, we, we've been doing quite a bit of research here about what type of chemicals. And so we find PCBs, uh, PAHs, DDT, you know, all that stuff that, you know, you don't want on your hands and stuff like that. You definitely don't want it in your body. And uh, it has harmful impacts to animals as well. And so we don't want them consuming that. And then, you know, the human health part of this is, you know, we don't have a clear answer to this yet, but there's people that are researching it. And that is, you know, say the fish that we eat, say they're eating these nurdles and then do those chemicals come off of the nurdle through the stomach lining and into the muscle tissue that then we're eating with, say, a redfish or trout or something. So there is some research going into that right now, and hopefully we'll have that answer here in a number of maybe two or three years. So our methodology is real simple, and I know a few of you on here have already um, done this, um, but you go out to the beach uh, or river or the lake shoreline, you know, we're finding these nurdles everywhere. So the methodology is real similar. You go down to the water line, you look for the, the most recent high tide line, which usually there's sticks and leaves and some natural debris there. But if you move that stuff around, lots of times you'll find nurdles in there. So once you find your first nurdle, you start your clock for 10 minutes and you pick up as many nurdles as you can. And then after that 10 minutes, you count how many you have. And then you just go to nurdlepatrol.org and we have a reporting form there that you fill out with you know, your date of when you were there, how many nurdles you found, how many volunteers, and then uh, the location. And the location is you just click on the map and it automatically puts your latitude longitude in there. So it makes it real simple. But that's it. And then uh, by doing that, we're able to be able to compare one location to another. So a place that has really high concentrations could be a possible source. And depending on where the data was collected, you know, we might even contact uh, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and make a report to them, uh, depending on um, if it warrants that. 
Uh, we've also started converting a lot of our materials to Spanish, and that's because we just received a $400,000 grant from the NOAA Marine Debris Program to expand what we're doing here in the U.S. Uh, to do it all the way down through about Mexico. So we're creating these kits and stuff like that to send out through Mexico to try to get uh, more participation down there because the more information we have, the more we can try to solve the problem. You know, if we only have the United States, we only have a, a piece of the problem. Uh, but we are making changes and I'll tell you about some of those. One thing we did early on is we came up with a methodology uh, that could be repeated. And that's real important when you're talking about science. Uh, you know, researchers that want to use, the, use this data uh, for you know, uh, whatever project they're working on, they want to make sure that the data was collected uh, in a way that can be repeatable and that is good. And so we ended up getting the methodology published in Marine Pollution Bulletin, and it's open source. So that means you can download it for free. You can send it to each other for free. You know, there's no fee to be able to look at this. You just uh, type in Nurtle Patrol methodology and this scientific paper will come up. Uh, the other reason is, is for litigation. So uh, there are a number of places around the country where they're using the Nurtle Patrol data uh, to go after the companies that are discharging these plastic pellets into the environment. And uh, they've been successful. And having this methodology published is key to making the data legitimate. Okay, so what does it look like? Say you go out and you do your 10 minute survey, you go into your report, it takes about less than one minute to put your NERDL survey data in there. Then you can go to the map and it's like a Google Earth type platform, right? So you can zoom in right to your house, uh, to the bay system or the state, you know, whatever you want, zoom into what you want and you can print it up digitally or hard copy. And this map tells us a number of things. And, You'll notice the colored dots on here. And so I'll kind of explain those. Um, people go out and if they don't find anything, it's considered zero. And that is a good information to know, uh, zero data. And so look at Florida. You see the west coast of Florida there has a lot of greens, right? Those are a lot of zeros. Just people didn't find anything. And you don't want, you want to know why that probably is? Uh, well, one of it probably has to do with currents and how the currents in Gulf of Mexico work, but also. Uh, Florida doesn't have a many plastic manufacturing sites. You really don't get to having plastic manufacturing sites until you get up near Pensacola, which is way up in the panhandle. And that's where you start seeing the orange colors, which is 31 to 100 nurdles in a 10 minute period. And then as you go west, you start getting into the reds and the purples and the purples are over a thousand nurdles in 10 minutes collected by hand. So, um, this map shows you how many nurdles are collected through the concentrations for one person for 10 minutes. And so say some, we have school groups go out all the time. There's 25 people. They go out, they'll put their nurdle survey in, uh, say we found a thousand nurdles and there was 25 of us and we were out there for an hour. The database automatically standardizes all the data to these color code dots to, for one person for 10 minutes. So it divides all those numbers up. So this is, you can look at this and you can compare what's going on in Key West compared to what's going on in Galveston versus San Francisco. And it's all comparable. So that's, that's a really important point. Now I'm gonna zoom in here and show you as Texas. And then after that, I'm gonna zoom in even more to show you Galveston. Uh, so there's a couple of things here in Texas. Uh, one is you can see along the coast, almost, almost every part of the coast has been sampled. There is a barrier island off of Matagorda Bay that has not been, I haven't been able to get over there. And I don't, and nobody else has sampled over there either. So there's a little gap. Of course, there's no manufacturing sites there. So that's not, that wouldn't tell us a whole lot anyway. But um, look inland from the coastline. There's almost like this straight little line inland, right? Well, that is uh, along streams or along railroads. There's been over 100 railroads that have been sampled, and almost all of them have found nurdles at them. And so remember I told you transportation is a key way that some of these nurdles are getting out, right? Well, this is evidence of that. And in some areas, it's really high concentrations of nurdles. Um, and then, other, you know, I had a group up in uh, 
uh, Dallas, Fort Worth area, they said, you know, we want to be involved. You know, what can we do? And I thought, well, you know, see if there's any plastic manufacturing sites around your area. And sure enough, there was. And they went out and sampled around the fence lines and uh, down the creeks, just downstream from where these manufacturing sites were and in the lakes that are the drinking water for these communities. And they found nurdles in them. So if you look at the map, and you zoom into the Dallas-Fort Worth area, you'll see a lot of reds. They're finding over 100 nurdles in 10 minutes in a lot of these areas, even along the lake shorelines of the drinking water. So, you know, anywhere, anybody anywhere can be, get involved with this. And so it's, it's a simple methodology and easy to, easy to do. Now, um, there's a number of groups in Galveston that have gotten involved uh, with actually training nurdle patrollers to go out um, taking school groups out. The Galveston Bay Foundation is one of those groups. Uh, they have nurdle trainings that they do. Uh, the, the, sea, the Turtle Island Restoration Network is another one, a really great par partner. And then a new partner we just got is the Texas Marine Mammal Stranding Network, and they have volunteers that go out as well and do uh, surveys. But one of the key things about this is, and Stenny Meadows has been, was one of the first people to go out in the Galveston Bay Area and start getting nurdle data back in 2018 when we first started. And the numbers she got were mind-blowing. So the, the highest concentration in Galveston Bay was collected at Texas City Dyke at over 30,000 pellets in 10 minutes. And, and if you can imagine, and so I, I, it was almost unbelievable. So I actually went up to these sites and sampled myself. And sure enough, the high tide line during certain times of the year, especially after rainfall events, is just solid nurdles. And you want to know why that is. Galveston has the highest number of manufacturing sites in the United States right here in the Galveston Bay area. And so that's kind of telling. And it's been real helpful to be able to show this data that's been collected up here by citizen scientists to the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, who's supposed to be um, regulating these companies. And so just a couple of months ago, um, TCEQ is the acronym for Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. They actually changed their permits uh, to say plastic pellets need to be reduced uh, or prevented for these sites, which before, before any of this was ever shown, it did their permits didn't even save plastic pellets. So this was huge. And I and I credit Stenny and all, all the volunteers in the Galveston area for making that happen. Okay, so this was the spill I told you about. Um, Galveston has the highest concentration of pellets being found anywhere in the country right now. Uh, except for the Mississippi River during the spill of um, August of 2020 last year. That's the only time that there's ever been more nurdles found somewhere else. And this was because of that container ship that had uh, broken open and then, you know, just flowing down the river. They were, the highest concentration they got uh, a, like a day or two after the spill was 250,000 pellets in 10 minutes. And it's because they were able to they were scooping up like this with their hands, two hands, just scooping up, filling up buckets with their hands. Um, and so you might ask, uh, you know, how, did, how are they able to count all those? Well, it's not uncommon in science where, you know, if we're looking at a Petri dish with a bunch of plankton in it, you know, you take a subset of it and then you calculate how many squares are in, in that uh, Petri dish and you can make an estimate. And so that's similar to what we do here. We know a a cup of nurdles is 4,000. You know, we know a teaspoon is 200, you know, so you can, you can um, kind of estimate uh, your numbers that way whenever you have so many of them. Uh, okay, so the latest stats is we have, we've had over 5,000 volunteers to date that have sent nerd, uh, data into uh, nurdlepatrol.org. Uh, there's been over 10,000 surveys performed at over 4,500 sites. Uh, uh, most of those are within the United States, and within the United States, most of those are in Texas, which that's where it first started. Um, uh, at least that's where uh, we initiated the program was in Texas. But there is now over 17 countries. There's, there's 17 countries that have 
submitted data into neuropatrol.org. So that shows us that it's expanding, uh, which is exciting. We've got over 140 partner organizations we're working with, and I'm going to show y'all, you know, how y'all become a partner if y'all are interested. And then we created these teacher kits so that um, teachers can teach their classes about what plastics are, how they get into the ocean, what the impacts are, and then have the students try to formulate solutions for fixing the problem. Now, the only way we're able to do this is from funding from other sources. And the biggest funding we've, that's really kickstarted all this was uh, Formosa Plastics was sued by Diane Wilson and the San Antonio Bay Estuarine Waterkeepers. And Formosa Plastics was discharging plastic pellets into the waterway. Diane and her volunteers went out every single day for about three years, collected enough information to where they were able to open a lawsuit uh, against Formosa uh, for a Clean Water Act um, uh, settle, or a lawsuit. And they ended up winning. They were suing for 160 million and they got 50 million out of it. And not only that, but Formosa agreed to have zero plastic pellet discharge written into their permit. And if there was ever any discharge of plastic pellets, they would be fined. And, uh, you know, so Neural Patrol gets a million of that. And so we get 200,000 per year for five years. And we're in our second year of it right now. But we're doing a number of different things. And so I'm going to show you some of that and, and how y'all can get involved if y'all are interested in this as well. But uh, some of it is, I've got this picture here of billboards. And we put these near manufacturing sites, plastic manufacturing sites, so they can that are living in and around these areas know that there's a way that they can help contribute to pollution that might really be in their backyard. Um, we also, in May of this year, we came out with a phone app. And so if you have an uh, iPhone or an Android, you can download this app. And the app is really meant to be able to help you put in your data uh, really quick. If you're I mean, it takes 15 seconds. Once you, you're all set up, like the first time you open it up, you got to create a profile. But after that, uh, I mean, literally it takes 15 seconds uh, to be able to put your data in. So if you're going to do, if you think you're interested in getting, doing some stuff like that, uh, download that app. Because we're about to make some improvements to that app as well. Hopefully showing all the, all the data like you can see on the, the website now. Okay, so um, I told you earlier there's 140 partners we work with. We've sent out 140 of these startup kits. And so the startup kits have everything that an organization need to be able to start doing their own uh, citizen science project, like getting volunteers involved, you know, giving them the tools they need to go out and do the surveys, and then some extra fun swag. You know, we've got 100 glass sampling vials, tweezers. Uh, we've got field notebooks, a flash drive that actually has this presentation on it that organizations can put their logo on to make it their own. Uh, informational cards, and it all goes into like this duffel bag. But um, we put this together so that if organizations wanted to start up their own Nurdle Patrol, they could. Or if they want to just incorporate surveys they're already doing, if they want to put Nurdle surveys into like water quality surveys they're doing already, they can do that as well. It's really just to incentivize trying to get folks to, uh, uh, you know, really get their community involved in uh, doing a citizen science project. And so if y'all are interested in that, you just send me an email. My email will be at the end of this. And uh, if you're part of another organization or, or even this one, I can send y'all one. Just let me know. I'd be happy to do that. These are valued about $250, somewhere in there. Um, and so we didn't want to be sending those out to teachers that weren't taking their kids out to sample. So because we had a bunch of teachers asking us, hey, we want to we want to teach our kids. So we came up uh, this year in February with a curriculum. Uh, that has six sam that has six jars of myrtles in there so that they can pass it out to their students, they can get into groups, and they can formulate solutions for this plastic problem. And so we send these out. These are only $18, uh, but it's got uh, on a flash drive on there that's got a bunch of different resources, uh, publications, articles, uh, even the informational card that you see there in the picture, and we throw some stickers in there. But this is all in the hopes of sending these out across the country so that uh, teachers can start really spreading the word. And so this is where we've sent all this stuff. So teacher kits are in the red dots and then um, the green and yellow are the startup kits. 
And so the green or the, the, like we have a quarterly reporting that we have to do for this uh, funding. So the green ones are ones that we have given out in the past and the last three months are the yellow. So if you see yellow and green, that's the difference there. But uh, will we send these anywhere? And uh, actually we just sent some teacher kits over to Kenya. It took about six weeks to get over there and cost, uh, costs way more to get it over there than it does what those kits are worth. <laughs> but they're doing surveys over there in Kenya. It's pretty cool. Um, now, it almost seems overwhelming. You know, all, all the nurdles out there, um, a lots of plastics, uh, and just not only manufactured, but transported. It's like, what do you do about this? Well, we think that, you know, having stricter permits for any of these um, companies that are handling plastic pellets is the way to go. And so think back to three months ago, Texas general permit for uh, these companies handling plastic pellets didn't even mention plastic pellets. Their language was that they were allowed a trace amount of suspended solids. And so it was a loophole. But remember Formosa I just told you about, they said that they make one trillion pellets a day and that a trace amount of suspended solids to them is 120,000 plastic pellets per day that they should be allowed to be discharged into the waterway. Luckily, the judge said no way and put a stop to that. But that just goes to show you it's a loophole. And so luckily, a couple of months ago, um, TCEQ came out and said uh, they actually put plastic pellets in there and that companies need to prevent plastics from getting into the environment. We, uh, there's, there's a group, the foundation, um, they had developed a bill, a Texas Nurdle bill, and they want to see zero plastic pellet in there because zero is uh, undeniable. You know, you find pellets, uh, then they need to put, the action can be taken immediately. And so uh, that's what we think ought to happen. And, you know, there's a couple other things that go with that. You know, ultimately, we'd like to see the Environmental Protection Agency come out and say that these are hazardous material because currently, the pellets are not considered hazardous materials, so they're handled totally differently. And obviously, real sloppy. And so we'd like to see that. Um, okay, so here's the Texas Nurdle Bill I just told you about. Uh, uh, Representative Todd Hunter, who's a Republican, authored this bill, and it went into the legislative session. It was filed uh, this year in March. And then because of COVID and a bunch of other stuff, and because was already making some changes to their permit. Uh, we've gone into what's called an interim study. So we're working with uh, Representative Hunter. Uh, we're going to be working with the plastics industry and TCEQ on what data gaps to fill so that we can bring this bill back in 2023 uh, to be able to make sure that we have a, a good bill that can make some real strong changes uh, to the way that things are currently being done. So look, look out for that. This can, you can also go to nerdlepatrol.org and on the solutions page, you can download this, the bill. And we did it that way because we wanted other states to be able to download it and be able to present this to their legislative session as well. Because currently California is the only state that has plastic, zero plastic pellet discharge outlined in their um, permits. And so there's a lot to do. Every, every state in the country can adopt this language. Uh, we've got a number of other um, projects that we're working on. Uh, you know, we, we're trying to expand further across the United States. Uh, this money from Formosa is, is helping us do that. We're also, uh, we got money from the local National Estuary Program here in the Coastal Bend to be able to look at chemicals absorbed into these nurdles. And then we're, we've also got some funding from 11th Hour Racing, which is an international sailing group. They're interested, of course, what's in the ocean and what's polluting it. And so we're trying to identify how to fingerprint these nurdles to figure out really where they're coming from. And so we're doing that. And then we just received the funding to expand down through Mexico. So we're real busy. We've got a couple of uh, staff that are working for us now, almost full time on just nurdle patrol stuff. We also have internship opportunities. So if you know of anybody uh, that like to do interns, most of the time we have them during the summertime, but we had one this last summer 
that went along the Mississippi River and looked for organizations to be able to partner with us. And so they would make the connection and they would let us know, oh yeah, this person, uh, this organization wants a startup kit. And so they've been sampling up the Mississippi River now. So you can go to that neuropatrol.org map and kind of look and see where they've been uh, sampling. It's, it's kind of fun to watch the new stuff that comes in almost daily. Um, and then this next year, uh, we've got some fun stuff going on. I told you about Diane Wilson. She's actually got a really cool story. Um, she's a fourth generation shrimper. She's an author. She's written several books. Uh, we're doing a film, a four part film series with her about her growing up, about her fight with Formosa, about her work with Nurtle Patrol, and then what the future holds um, for her uh, going forward. And so those are, that's the four parts I just outlined. We've already finished two of them. They're not out yet. We're still putting them all together, but we've filmed two of them. And in January, we'll be going up and filming the third one with her. We'd also like to do the Great River Road Nurtle Expedition. So currently, if you go to the homepage of nurtlepatrol.org, you'll see the Gulf Coast Nurtle Expedition. It's an 18 minute uh, video, entertaining and informative about Nurtles and the mission that we're on. Uh, but we wanna do the same thing down the Mississippi River, which is there's a great river road if you've ever heard of that going down the Mississippi. And so we want to do something similar there. Uh, we're also revamping the website and uh, we're going to have newer technology. We're going to have it to where people can query the data and download it. Currently, people have to get a hold of me if they want the actual spreadsheet to you know, go through the data. Um, so this way, people can download it themselves. And then, of course, we're always looking to expand you know, through the U U.S. and beyond. We got a couple of tools. I mentioned to you, nerdlepatrol.org. That's probably the best place you could go to to look at news um, and then the map. And we've also got a four minute training video. So if you remember nothing else about what I said today, just nerdlepatrol.org and watch that training video so you'll know how to do your own survey. And then we've got a Facebook group if you're interested in uh, daily updates. People are posting almost on a daily basis of what they're finding and where, if any. Uh, if there's a nurdle spill, you know, it shows up here within uh, minutes. People are like putting it on there. Uh, any kind of new research coming out, it's all on the Facebook page called Nurdle Patrol. It's a closed group, but I'll let you in. I've never denied anyone. I've had to kick somebody out one time. Uh, they were getting all crazy on me, but uh, um, I haven't ever denied anyone from getting in. So there's about 2,700 people on there too. So it's a pretty good group, group of folks, real supportive. Um, Mission Aransas. Uh, has a YouTube channel and there's a there's a playlist called Nurdles. So if you click on that, there's a bunch of uh, different stuff. There's even a what about Galveston Bay Nurdles. And so if you want to see a bunch of Nurdles, watch that one. Uh, I think you'd be blown away. And then this is the, the about the Nurdle expedition that I was talking about where we went around the Gulf of Mexico. We hit every accessible point in the Gulf of Mexico in a like a 10 day period. It was like nonstop driving and nurdle surveys. But this is the Dry Tortugas. That's where we ended up was the Dry Tortugas in the, out in the Gulf. Right. And there's nurdles out there too. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, what are we doing all this for? Well, these are my kids, Jack and Parker. You know, they, they ought to be out there picking up seashells, right? Instead of making them pick up plastic pellets. But, you know, these plastic pellets, they don't go away. They will be around for hundreds of years. They will just keep accumulating. Um, you know, these aren't going to even go away in their children's lifetime. So, you know, there's something we can do about this now. It's 100% preventable from happening. Uh, we know that there's a problem now that Nurdle Patrol has shown that. And so um, y'all should join us and be a part of the solution. With that, thank you. And here's my email. And feel free to ask any questions. And I'll be around. Oh, thank you so much. That gave me a, a lot to think about and a lot of information, and I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Jace. We do have some questions. The first question comes from Gene. Yeah, yeah, Jace. You know, I've been hearing about these, you know, harmful chemical absorption, and I, in my little mind, I pictured myself or a turtle or some other friend eating a turtle, and then our digestive system extracting the plastic chemicals or the chemicals that made the plastic. But what I think you, what I think I heard you say is no, it's not so much that as that nurdle floating in the environment, absorbing like a sponge chemicals from the environment. 
and then that neural getting into my de- digestive tract, and then me sucking those bad chemicals out of the sponge, if you will. Have I got that close? Yeah, you're right. I mean, most likely these uh, nurdles are inert as of themselves. Um, right. It's okay. it's once they're floating around in the environment. And, you know, Galveston Bay has an issue with PCBs. So you right. can almost guarantee that right around that Texas City dike, some of those nurdles floating out there are probably going to be high in PCBs. Okay. Well, that helps me understand because I, I'm, I'm with you. I thought they were inert or I didn't think my digestive tract could really break down the plastic, but well, now I get it. And I appreciate you being so clear about that because now I can explain it to others. Thank you. <laughs> Great. And our next question comes from Pam. Pam, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Mm, Pam might be having a little trouble. What what Pam asked is, she said, is that plastic manufacturing sites or manufacturing generally the highest in Galveston Bay? You you mentioned that. uh, I'm I'm finally unmuted. I was just trying to get clarified whether it was manufacturing in general or just plastic sites or both, perhaps. (laughs) Oh, yes, it's uh, plastic manufacturing sites. That's the highest in the country uh, there in Galveston Bay area. Okay, great. Thank you. And it, it's also the, the highest concentration of plastic pellets we're finding. <laughs> there's, a, there's a combination there. It, there seems to be a relation, right? <laughs> right, exactly. <Yeah. laughs> and Janet and Jackson, our visiting student, have a question for you. Okay, so uh, I'm doing my science fair project on designing a device that uh, prevents the leaking of nurdles. I'm wondering if they're leaking, like leaking from the rail cars, like when they're dropping them off or when they're loading them, or is it just all over the road uh, track? That's a great question. And so I've talked to the folks in the plastics industry that work on the rail car system to make sure that they are not losing pellets. And so uh, one way is when they're onloading or offloading, so that tube they have to put on or off, they do uh, spill there and they make special buckets. If they would use these special buckets that would capture them, that would solve the problem uh, at the site. Now, the other problem you have is that um, because when they pneumatically blow these through uh, that tube, it creates these angel hairs. And so if you can imagine, uh, certain plastics have certain uh, melting points to them, but the friction from those nurdles going through that tube uh, melts, can melt some of the plastics, and it creates these long, like, hairs that get stuck up into the rail car silos. And so, you know, once they, they think the rail car's full, they put a cap on it, zip tie it, they close off the valves, it goes to its final destination down the railroad, you know, gets to the factory. They unload all the nurdles and they think that these rail cars are empty, but because of the angel hair that stuck up on the side inside of those silos in the rail car, there's actually nurdles stuck in there. And so if they don't put the caps back on and close the valves because they think they're empty, whenever those rail cars are going back to the manufacturing site to be filled back up, they're going along and they're just leaking nurdles. And so that is what the plastic folks have told me is that they need to ensure that once they unload all the nurdles from the rail cars, that they need to put the caps back on and, and, and zip tie it, and then also close the valves. If they did that, there would be no nurdles that would be leaking out. That's what I've been told by the folks in the plastics. All right, thank you. You're welcome. And, and if you have any questions whatsoever after this, Feel free to email me and, uh, you know, we'll make sure you get a good grade on that science fair project. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe after this is over, Jace, you can put your email address in the chat so people can copy it down. And our next question. It's on the screen there, if y'all can see it, but uh, I can put it in the chat also. Okay, sounds good. It's right there. Jace at utexas.edu. Got it. All right, our next question is from Chuck. Okay, uh, my question's around the, the surveys and 
uh, resurveys. So I assume that that uh, areas that have been surveyed are going to be resurveyed at some point in time. A uh, couple parts to the, the, the follow up question. Are you saving all the data historically as as you collect this? And then what shows on the map? Is it going to be the, the latest survey data, the highest, the the uh, average, <laughs> have you thought about that? I don't know. But oh yeah, I thought a lot about it and you're the first person to ever, ever ask me about it. So I'm so glad you did. <laughs> the, uh, so let me start with uh, all the data is, is saved and every once in a while um, we will get requests from researchers that wanna try to figure out where these are coming from uh, through ocean currents, uh, through, uh, storm surges, uh, uh, wave height, you know, they want to try to figure out when are they coming up more often or where might they be going circulating in the ocean. And so we can download all that and then we can send it to them and then we give them a, a reference uh, for it. Um, and so, yeah, we do keep, we do keep it all. And uh, so your other question was about the map, right? So the map, the color, dots are the highest concentrations are above all others. And so um, if you zoom in, so if you click, say if you're zoomed all the way out to the United States and you click on a dot, it might tell you that there's 50 nurdles or 50 surveys that were done on that dot. But if you zoom in and Galveston Bay is a real good place to do this. There's Sullivan Beach there, or mm -hmm. is it Sullivan Beach? So uh, you yep. can zoom right into it. And there's been so many surveys there that you have to zoom in to where you can see count people's cars, but you can individually see all the different surveys there. Then you can click on the dot and you can get the data for just that one survey that was done. But how we organize them in the database is highest concentration is on top. Okay. Thank you. Great question. You guys are doing a ton of work. My gosh. Um, the next question is from Patty. And so Patty, if you'll unmute yourself, ask your question. Hi, Jace. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. It's so interesting every time I see it. Um, so in some of the pictures, it was shown that the volunteers are using gloves when they're picking up the nurdles. Is that because like it was a yucky beach or should we be wearing gloves when we pick up the nurdles? I don't wear gloves. The only time we have to wear gloves is if we're doing a research project where we're trying to look at contaminants within the, or that are absorbing onto the uh, nurdle. And that's what the situation was with this project is that uh, we had special jars that we had, um, uh, that were all cleaned out and we used tweezers and we also used gloves because we didn't want to contaminate any of our oils or anything that might have been in our skin with what we were collecting. But if you're just doing a nurdal survey, you're fine just not wearing um, any gloves at all. Now, if, uh, if you're going to be doing like collecting on a daily basis, you know, it's probably like anything, you, don't, you, you probably want to wear gloves if you're going to plan on doing this uh, for many years every single day. But you'd be fine if you're doing it, you know, once a week or something like that. And that, that's what I do. I do multiple surveys per week and uh, I just had a little twitch. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Uh -huh. All right, the next question, uh, Steny, would you like to un unmute? I can read the Okay, I, I found oh. the button. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm unmuted now. Um, yes, uh, having been involved, working, having worked for TCEQ and been involved in many uh, spill cleanups, I am wondering and hoping that at some point in time, and this is really a question, is do we have any hope of finding the responsible party by analyzing the, the nurdles and therefore making them clean it up without going to court. Yeah, um, that's, that's gonna be a hard one. You know, even, in, and I'll use the Mississippi spill, for example, that happened 
you know, August of 2020. Um, you know, there, the barge owner, was he responsible or was it the crane operator that knocked it over or was it Dow Chemical that had their pellets in it? You know, nobody could figure it out. And so they didn't start trying to clean up the myrtles till five days later. Yeah. And, you know, it might be a similar, it's probably going to have to be uh, depending on the situation. And, you know, if it's a real easy one, yeah, they would have to go out. And so what we've seen, and Steny, you probably know this, but we have a number of different volunteers that go out, myself included, that will sample around a facility, a, a plastic manufacturing site. And if we find nurdles right outside of their uh, plant that's in their stormwater or whatever, and we know it came from them, we file a complaint to TCEQ and then they go out and do an unannounced inspection within 14 days. And every single one of those that we have done has found nurdles. They've had to do take different measures on site, the plastic manufacturing folks, to be able to um, see where these nurdles got out, try to prevent that from happening again, and then sometimes even go to enforcement. And so, um, you know, certain situations we can find out, but whenever you go to the beach, I was just in Galveston um, last week. And on Thursday morning, I went out and I did a survey and I found 136 nurdles in 10 minutes, right there by the Pleasure Pier. Yeah. There is probably no way to find out where any of those came from right now. So what I'd like to see and, uh, you know, is the plastics industry, you know, they can tell whether they made the nurdle or not, that the specific plant, they can tell whether they made it or not based on shape and size alone or by the chemical makeup. So there's two different ways. And so if that information could be given over to the regulatory agency, then now we have a way to be able to trace back to the source. But right now, yeah. all that information is proprietary. So I don't yeah. see that happening anytime soon. So that's, and so that's what I think is real important about collecting all this information and showing that there's a problem because hopefully the government would finally say, look, we need to be able to figure out where these are coming from and how do we do that? And, and so they need to be able to have that proprietary information that, that companies have. Well, and I'm, I'm thinking specifically of that site at Texas City Dye. <clears throat> I, every time after a high tide, I go out and there's another huge mat of those nurdles. And I'm thinking they're coming from some old landfill. And um, so there, there are all sorts of circumstances we can find around Galveston Bay. <laughs> Because this is reoccurring so uh, frequently, and it's the same story every time, and they're all weathered. You've seen them, yeah. so you know how old and weathered they are. <clears throat> Pardon my throat today, but um, and I have called TCEQ about that site, and not not heard anything. I've uh, issued three complaints our assistant, our uh, citizens request for assistance. And, and I haven't heard that. They probably, so, they probably just don't know where they're coming from, although. The right, but it, it is, is right there. But this is more like a Superfund site than, <laughs> right. than a spill. Uh, well, I've seen your uh, pictures yeah. when, when those mats come in. It's incredible how many nurdles are coming in. Million. Yeah, and it's every time. It's every time. It's really um, upsetting. Yeah. But um, yeah, so, but all your work is wonderful. And, you know, without you starting this, we would never know. And um, so we just need to keep working at it. Another thing I wanted to mention is I reviewed several of the plastic manufacturers notice of registration, and that is where they, they have to list all their waste. And plastic pellets or nurdles were not mentioned in any one of them. Wow. So I think that's another area for them to manage. That's another opportunity for industry to regulate them on site. They were thrown in with class three non-hazardous 
class three non-hazardous waste, which includes concrete and, and uh, bricks. So they were once considered totally inert and unharmful. And if they can be reclassified even to a class two waste, then the manufacturer's industry has to manage them properly on site rather than just through a wastewater discharge permit. And they would have to be checked at every inspection. So that's another, yeah, that's another area that we, we can work on um, and I'm happy to help you with that. Excellent, thank you. All right, we still got a few more questions. Maureen, would you like to unmute? Yes, um, Jace, uh, I, at Galveston State Park, I take, we do NERDL uh, surveys with different school groups and people coming in. And I always get asked this question, what happens to the NERDLs that are collected? So we ask people to put them in a cool jar and tell other people about them. Um, all the ones that we collect, we, people do send us, whenever they have a big bag of them, they'll send them to us. Um, and uh, Stanley, I think you might have sent us some before, but uh, Diane Wilson I, sends us yeah. big bags of them. And we put those in the teacher nurdle kits. So those teacher nurdle kits, uh, we will not buy nurdles from the store to put in there. We will only use ones that we found from the environment because we don't want to contribute to you know, adding more of a demand. So um, we, 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 we use though, we reuse them in those teacher nurdle kits. And so if somebody just does not want them in their house for whatever reason, we suggest putting them into an old pickle jar or something that they can seal up and put them in their, you know, kitchen trash that can be sealed up because these can't be recycled, you know, they're too small. And if you just throw them in your uh, big trash can, uh, they'll just fall out again. So they need to be able to be sealed up. Okay, and one more question from Gene. Yeah, me again, sorry. I, I've been operating under misconceptions all this time and you're helping me out. I always pictured these railroad cars going down the road with an open top and things flying out the top. And you're telling me they're in tankers and you're telling me the only egress and whatever the other word is, is through these ports. So I, they got that figured out, is that right? Well, not... there's actually two ways they can load and uh, offload these. And that one is the pneumatic way. And that's through the, the, the right. bottom part. So whenever you see the caps that are at the bottom, that, those yep. are the pneumatic one. The, the okay. other is they can gravity feed from the top. Okay. But, but they, have, uh, they have hatches. Okay, but they do have hatches. It's not like that 18 wheeler full of gravel going down the road in front no. of the stuff flying. All right, well, that's no, good. No. That's how I pitched it. Well, part of that is, um, you know, if these things get any dirt on them, the whole batch yeah. is contaminated. Well, and that so, brings me to the other. Okay, sorry. Yeah, when, I mean, so like the ones that fall on the ground, they can't just pick those up and throw them back in the batch. Those are now contaminated and they have to recycle them if they have the facilities to do that, or they just have to throw them away. Wow. And if there's a derailment, do these tank cars tend to rupture or are they fairly intact? Oh, yeah. No, they, they can uh, break open pretty easily. Actually, a couple of weeks ago, there was a rail car that broke open. There was about four rail cars that uh, came off their tracks and uh, they were nurdles spilled all over the place. Okay. That, okay. Happens, so that, that actually makes... happens a few times a year. Okay. And then my last question, I didn't write it down, is... Are these, I assume all nurdles, the density of them, are they're very buoyant? Are any of them so dense that they actually sink? Or do you even know? Yeah, so we the ones we find washing up uh, are about 80% sure. of them are polyethylene, the low okay. density polyethylene. And then um, the, the other 20% is uh, polypropylene. And so the PVC, the polystyrene, you know, some of these other high density ones, those are sinking. We're just not finding those. Okay. And so they're still out there, but yeah. they're just sinking. They're at the bottom. The bottom yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks, man. Good stuff. Okay. There's one last question, but I think you pretty much just answered it uh, that Doris uh, put in. Do, no, do, do nurdles float or settle on the bottom of the bays, rivers, or ocean? Yeah. So both. Um, you know, the ones that we find on railroads, 
are a little bit different. You know, we find the we find PVC and uh, like polystyrene before it's made into styrofoam. Uh, you know, it's the dense stuff. We find a lot of that along railroads and on the beaches, uh, river banks, and lake shorelines. We're finding mainly the polyethylene and the polypropylene. Okay, we've got uh, Cindy. Do you want to ask your question? Okay, um, great presentation. Thank you. Um, my question is to the spilled myrtles that get recovered, but they're contaminated, like you just mentioned, do they go into landfills then if they can't be recycled? Yeah, um, if the facility doesn't have, you know, a recycle center where they can, um, you know, reuse these, yeah, they go into the landfill. Wow, thank you. Alrighty, that are that's all the questions. We had 40 people attending today. Thank you again, uh, Jace. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I think you've recruited a number of new people for your Nerdle Patrol. We've got a lot of thank yous coming in too. Excellent.